Hey everybody, this is Ian O'Byrne again. Uh, we're taking a little bit of time to talk through different issues that impact us as teachers, as parents, um, as friends, as colleagues. Um, and, and this is a follow-up interview with my friend uh, Tim. We're going to talk about uh, some of the elements that we talked about before and then also specific mindsets that you need uh, as you, you know, interact with others uh, you know, out in the world. So, Tim, introduce yourself, please. So, my name is Tim Huey. I'm the uh, emergency management trainer for the Charleston County School District. I've been doing that now for about four years uh, as in that particular position. Mm -hmm. And so... Um, we get to work with a lot of schools and parents and students on what they should or should not do and what they should be aware of and you know what they should be looking for on their campuses and basically how they keep their campus safe. Mm -hmm. Now, um, Tim and I first met because we were talking about our pre-service teachers and having a session about um, what to do in the event of an incident, a critical incident, an active shooter, or some sort of violence on a, on a school campus. Um, so we sat down last time and we recorded some clean video to pull out some of these ideas, pull out some of these thoughts. Um, and we walked away from the talk and we were like, hey, we, we're missing some stuff here. Um, and so we wanted to get back in front of the camera because we're suckers and we wanted to record uh, some more detail because we feel like we left some of the stuff out. Um, and today what we want to talk about is vigilance. We talked a lot about vigilance in the earlier video. We want to take a little bit more time and talk about what is vigilance. And, and I was thinking about this a lot following up our, our first talk. And the thing is that your understanding and your mindset about vigilance is vastly different than mine. And Mindy's not here, but it's vastly different than hers. Um, and so one of the things we want to talk about is, you know, what is vigilance? What is that mindset? What's that perspective? Um, how did you get it? How do, why do I say that yours is different than mine? Like, what does that look like? How, did, how do you build that up? So I think, um, I know when you initially rolled this conversation out to me, there were four different pieces mm -hmm. that we want to talk about. So I, if, you, if that's all right, we'll kind of, because yeah. I think each one segues into the yeah. next. So what's vigilance? So, um, what, you know, my definition of vigilance is really not anything that I pulled from Webster's Dictionary. I, it's, mm -hmm. it's things that I've known over the past. Mm -hmm. And so here, my definition is simply this. Vigilance is being aware of your surroundings at all times and looking for things that are wrong or out of place, any type of dangerous activities or behaviors, or any criminal activities. So that's kind of my definition of vigilance. Um, you know, how does one become vigilant? That's, that's a kind of a loaded question in, in mm. itself because there's many different ways. You know, different folks are exposed to different life circumstances. So their vision may be a little bit broader than some. Um, in my particular case, mine was through kind of a myriad of things, life experiences. Um, I spent, I spent um, four years in the military um, and I spent the following you know, 21 years in civilian law enforcement. Um, so for me, my, some of my vigilance was learned, most of it was learned, through experiences. You know, the things that um, I'd, I'd be on a scene and I would, I'd hear a noise and I, I wouldn't catch it at first and I'd hear it again and I would look back and then I would see that there was somebody standing behind me, you know, potentially setting me up for a takedown or those sorts of things. So um, really, it can be situationally based. It can be, um, you know, training that occurs that has kind of enlightened you, just like, you know, becoming a teacher. I mean, you typically, some people, I think, have a, t a natural tendency towards certain things in life. Um, others have to be taught, you know. Um, when you think of leadership and leaders, mm -hmm. some people are, just have the ability to lead other people, and then others have to learn how to be leaders. Do you think you had it within you already, and then military and other stuff brought it out, or is it the, the experience and the stuff you're talking about? Well, I think as a kid, um, you know, trying to remember back, it's been a while. <laughs> um, as a kid, I do recall that there were just things that I just looked for. I mean, I just was always looking around mm -hmm. for, you know, for dangerous situations just because I lived in a, dang a dangerous environment. Um, but I think um, most of it was probably learned. You know, the ability uh, through, through military training, through law enforcement training, and then through actual field application, you know, being in, in that environment and looking and learning and learning from my, my partners and my coworkers and just picking up on all these different things mm. that kind of helped me become hypervigilant. Now, my family tells me that I'm the paranoid guy, but personally, I don't feel that way because I don't walk around scared all the time. I'm, I'm just looking for things that don't make sense to me. You know, I'm in a grocery store and I, last night, for instance, I'm in a grocery store and uh, happens to be a Walmart and I just happen to glance down a, a freezer section and I see a guy looking for vegetables. But what do you think I noticed in his buggy that you probably would never think about? A full-size tire stacked in this guy's buggy. Well, other people might just not even notice that. I'm like, the guy's got a tire yeah. in his buggy. 
you know, I mean, to me, it was odd, yeah. you know, and I point out to my kids and my kids laugh and took pictures of it, you know, I mean, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but it's just things like that, you know, just things that just don't make sense that are out of the, out of the norm and just picking up on those things, you know? Mm-hmm. So you mentioned, you know, we talked a little bit about what is vigilance and, and how, how, how you can learn to be vigilant or develop that, that perspective um, or that mindset. Uh, it's not one of the questions that I asked, but are are there places that we need to be vigilant and places that we don't need to be vigilant? I think that you should be vigilant everywhere. Um, you know, I mean, in your in your home, in your community, in your apartment complex, um, at school, you know, a- anywhere. Any, and, and in particular, you know, young people in particular. Um, most, I mean, sure, older people do get robbed and have crimes committed against them, but a lot of times... You know, I can walk down the street right outside this window and I can see young people walking with cell phones and they're looking at the cell phone and not looking at what's happening around them. You know, to be honest with you, I think that you face graver danger out there, you know, than anywhere else. But a lot of young people are focused on things that, you know, maybe don't, don't really matter when they forget about their life. So... I think you should be vigilant anywhere. I mean, to answer the question, yeah. at home, at work, at school, you just should be looking for those things that are not right or wrong or out of place. I, don't I remember taking the subway in through like New York City and stuff like that. You know, I was working in, in New Haven, and so we take the subway in and around or in Boston and stuff like that. And you would never sit on the subway car with like your cell phone out. <laughs> you know, people would buy, specifically buy cases that right. made their phone look old or destroyed or they you know have they leave their good phones and stuff like that at home right. and not bring out their good stuff whereas here it's sort of like we walk out with these these toys and these trappings all the time right and don't think about like who's paying attention to that right and you know and criminals pay attention they, that's just that's what they do they pay attention and they look for their next victims they they lurk they look and, and whatever type of crime they're looking to you know perpetuate there mm-hmm. or they just look, and they're all the time looking. And so a lot of things that I, I tell our, our employees are look at who's looking at you. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, certainly you may have a member of the opposite sex or even the same sex looking at you because maybe they're interested in you. Yeah. But, you know, if you look at those who are looking at you and pay attention and see them and make eye contact with them, a lot of times that can also kind of, you know, disturb their, mm-hmm. oh, now they're looking at me. And they may, they may give up their plot, you know, per se. Yeah. Um, we talked a little bit off camera about, you know, the need for parents to be vigilant, you know, and talk to their kids and, and not just teachers, but, um, you know, and, and trying to figure out when do we start that sort of dialogue, um, you know, and it's you're, you're hanging out in the front yard with a bunch of other families and you see that car drive by or right. somebody walks by and you're like, well, that's a little bit odd. You know, let's pay attention to that as that come, you know, see if that car comes by again or that person right. comes by again, um, you know, and and. and the challenges of having that dialogue with your kids. You know, I mean, teachers, as I said before, I, I know the, the day that, that my son, you know, in, in first grade had that talk with his teacher, you know, about their strangers that are out there. Right. Um, and, I, and I know the challenge is there, but then I also see a lot of parents that don't want to have that dialogue with their kids. But you know, I they don't want to go there. Yeah, because I, I think that there's, you know, there's a delicate balance between building uh, an environment of fear Mm-hmm. You know, fear for just just the sense of making your kids scared, straight, scared of doing the right thing. But then I also think that there's an element of that that has to be I'm, I'm advising them. I'm making them aware of something mm-hmm. that could potentially be a problem. You know, and, I, and I, I've got two kids and I've told them both, you know, I want you to look around. I want you to pay attention. I want you to be vigilant. You know, all the things we're talking about right now. But at the same time, I also have to explain to them, you have to balance that. You know, I mean, if you walk around fearful that every single person is going to attack you or steal your stuff, yeah. then then we, we we're kind of defeated before anything ever even happens. So you, you have to balance that, you know, and just kind of having a, an edge of vigilance. I don't think there's anything wrong with being suspicious of people. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, some people do strange things, yeah. you know. I mean, you guys probably see it down downtown Charleston all the time. I mean, but... People do strange things, but I don't think there's anything wrong with being vigilant and having those discussions. And as a teacher, you know, you, you're going to have students from communities in, in some situations that there are, n- like, no parents involved. Mm-hmm. And there's, you know, there's gang activity in those communities, and there's drugs and violence and prostitution and, and you know, thefts and mm-hmm. just all of these things that these kids are observing on a day-to-day basis. And, you know, maybe having those conversations with the kids, they might say, yeah, you're right. These things do happen, yeah. you know, but you can talk to them and tell them don't be involved in those mm-hmm. things, you know, and that when they're here on campus, 
keep your eyes peeled for things that you might see in the neighborhood that are not appropriate here on this campus. Absolutely. Um, so one of the challenges that we have is, you know, we, we talk about vigilance, but then we always hear that, like, see something, say something. It's huge. You know, we, it, there's always that mantra of, like, if you see something, say something. H- how do you do that? Um, I, I, I guess some people are afraid. Mm-hmm. They're just simply afraid, or sometimes it's too inconvenient for – they see something that's, that's in their neighborhood, and they just walk past it and let it go. Ah, that won't happen again. But the problem is, um, I'm going to use some examples that, that I'm personally familiar with. Um, so if, if a bus driver observes what they believe to be a student walking down the side of the road who is not a student who rides that bus, and that individual is seen putting what looks like a pistol into their pocket, you know, the bus driver has two options at that point. They can just drive on past, do nothing about it, or they can make a phone call and let someone know. And in the end, it may turn out to be a squirt gun. It may turn out to be something that just looked like a gun and resembled it. Or it could be a real gun that the student was coming to school that day and was looking to hurt himself or other people or, you know, maybe a combination of both. Um, so, you know, the biggest thing is the inconvenience of notifying somebody. You know, I mean, there, there is some strings attached to that. So you contact law enforcement via 911. They're going to ask you for a lot of information. They're going to ask you for your personal information. You know, I mean, you can... In some cases, you don't have to give it. You can simply be an anonymous caller. Um, but there is the whole follow-through. Mm-hmm. I mean, you really have to follow through with what you're seeing and who you're notifying. Um, you know, and sometimes that's painful and it's inconvenient. I have found that in my – this is almost my 30th year in, uh, in, in you know, public service that many times I see things. It's just not convenient. It's at the end it's of – It's just a convenience it's thing? At the, it's at the end of the day – it's yeah. at the end of school. I'm sure it'll be okay. It's just, it's, none of these things are ever convenient. They mm-hmm. always happen seemingly at the worst time. It's happening during lunch. Mm-hmm. You know, somebody makes a threat and it happens right in a time frame that's going to inconvenience a lot of individuals. Mm-hmm. And so the person who sees it or hears it has a decision to make at that point. Am I going to do something about what I heard or saw or not? Mm-hmm. You know, and the danger with, with not is that if something happens and, the, and it's discovered through the investigations that a, a school teacher or, or anybody in that matter chose to look the other way, huh, you, you could end up prosecuted mm-hmm. and civilly liable. Then you'd have to live with yourself for whatever happened and you didn't say anything. I mean, there's just there's a lot of that to it, but a lot of times it's the inconvenience factor. Yeah. People just won't notify because it wasn't convenient. So, I mean, if I'm in a classroom, we usually have a, a chain of command, and so I would notify somebody else and, and you know, hopefully there's processes in place. So I would notify somebody else, um, you know, but then there's also the, the convenience and the notification elsewhere. You know, I mean, if you're walking down the street, as you said before, and you see something, right. you know, do you, do you call 911 and say, hey, I saw this person walking and they slipped a, a handgun into their pocket, you know, or um, last night I was at the baseball game and, you know, it was, it was clean up the night, you know, at, at, at the ballpark. And I'm sitting there and I saw a, a two people were in front of us seated and they got up to leave and there's just a beer can under the seat, you know, and I'm looking at it and I'm like, I asked my wife, like, who was, whose was that? Was that there? I mean, here it is like clean up the park night. Like every time somebody would make a mess, they're like, clean up the park. And here is this one thing sitting out. And I'm like, what is that? You know, do I, do I say something? Do I, do I pick it up? Do I call an usher and say, Hey, do you want to come check this out? You know, but uh, we're, we're seeing a lot of these instances where it could be just something left behind. Right. You know? Yeah. Um, you know, I mean, in this, in this time we don't, we don't get a whole lot of bomb threats. That's one thing we, we thank God we don't get a lot of them. We get them, but we don't get a lot of them, but we, we particularly do not get a lot of bomb threats with a suspicious package located. Mm. So in other words, you know, there's a, a, a device or something that resembles a device. We don't get a lot of those, but certainly we would want someone to tell us if they, if they saw something on the yeah. campus, you know I mean? They don't happen often, but when it does, it can be a, a very big deal with, with pretty big consequences. So yeah, I mean, it's, it's hard where you have to balance that, you know I mean? Well, is what it, I'm seeing life threatening or not? Yeah. You know, is, is a kid puffing a jewel in a class? Yeah. You know, and I, is it life threatening? No. Is it a school violation? Yes. Yeah. And we have rules and regulations to deal with it, um, you know, and it's that, that balance between that culture of fear and then being able to say, look, we just we want to be aware of our surroundings and we want to protect ourselves and, and those around us. 
And, you know, there's one other thing, too, that just comes to mind. You know, let's face it. There, there, are, there are people who will not do the right thing, regardless of what profession they're in. You know, and you can watch the news and read the clippings and, and see, what you, you see all these things that go on. So if, if the individual who's observing it also does these, these things on the side on their own, then chances are they're probably not going to report it. Yeah. You know, so there's the whole morality issue yeah. that kind of goes along with that as well. So um, if I'm in my classroom, there's there's usually processes that we follow. If I'm here in higher ed and I'm teaching class, there's things that I do and ways that I act. If I'm walking down the street, um, and I'm the weirdo that goes to the, when I was at orientation here and I started, I'm the person that raises my hand and say, what do we do in the event of an active shooter? What's the process? And it's day one. And everybody's like, what's this guy all about? You know, and I want to know. I've been, I've been in those situations. I don't want to wait till later to find out the answers. Right. Um, and so if I'm in my class or if I'm walking down the street, I think all of our numbers are piped to uh, here. I think like public safety gets it first or whatever. But my concern has always been what happens when you do say something? You do say something, you're in a school, you alert the school resource officer or an, an administrator, or you're out in the street, you make a phone call, or, you know, I'm teaching class and, and I see somebody walk by and I call, I, I call, you know, public safety, then what? Because there's always like, oh, well, we took care of it, no need to worry about it, but then you see the person again. Like, yeah. what, what do you do in that instance? Um, so, you know, I, th- I think the biggest part there is number one that an individual who is observing something on their campus that's mm-hmm. suspicious, you know I mean? Because on your campus, you do have a duty to report. You do. Mm-hmm. I mean, as a, as a public employee, whether it's at a private college or at a, a you know, school district in some mm-hmm. other state, there is a duty to report. I think there's probably procedures and practices all in place that, that obligate you to report things that you see. Um, and so once you've checked that box, I've made notification, I know that there is kind of an inherent need to know what happened. It's mm-hmm. kind of follow-up. Um, and whether or not you've reported to somebody and they've done something about it. You know, I, I know that was one of the specific things we talked about yeah. after our last session was, all right, so I'm a teacher, I observed something, and I told my administrator or I told my lead teacher, this is what I saw. Well, what, what then? So what, what happens next and what did that person do with the information? Um, so one of the things that we encourage our teachers to do is to follow up with an email, some some form of documentation that's trackable in in the actual entity's system. Back to the person you reported to. Back to the person you reported. Hey, just follow up with you. You know the email. It's real yeah. simple. So just to follow up on this. You know, just wanted to make sure you, you had even just that documenting I told you. that I told you this. Yes, because not like hey, we're going to crack this case together. Right. That's, <laughs> because I don't think that's a teacher's responsibility yeah. to crack that case. I think that's that falls on the administration yeah. and the police. And, you know, I got guys in my office who mm-hmm. were notified of these things. I think that's incumbent upon us to work through those issues. So, um, but I do think that documenting the actions taken, mm-hmm. you know, for more than one reason, because a lot of times people get extremely busy. You know, I mean, it's funny because on Sunday nights, I know when teachers are working because my kids' power school grades all start loading in. Yeah. And I start seeing all these grades pop up. I get six messages. I'm like, well, I know which teachers are working tonight. Yeah. You know, so... Having that documented in a, in a trackable, traceable form holds people accountable mm. for the information. You may not get the information back as, a, as an individual who reports it. You may never get that information back and that feedback, but certainly that puts someone on the hook Yeah, you know, for ensuring that they have done something about um, what you've told them. I get a lot of, a lot of new teachers coming in, and they tell me that they're working through you know, temporary staff services, and they say, yeah, you know, at this school over here, you know, I brought these issues up, and it just continued to happen. Yeah. You know, and when that happens, that was part of your question was, what do you do? Um, when that happens, if you don't get any follow through by the administration that you're working with, then there's people like me you can come to. Okay. You know, I mean, people, we've, I've had teachers contact us directly and say, hey, listen, here's what's going on. Mm-hmm. Here's who I've told about it. And it doesn't seem to stop. We're still seeing the same thing. And then folks like me can walk in and we can say, hey, listen, uh, we got information about this. And, you know, then then things may happen. Yeah. You know, I mean, not saying that administrators would blow these things off, but sometimes schedules get busy. Yep. You know, I mean, it's hard. It's There's a lot of work and there's mm-hmm. only a few amount, amount of hours in the day. Yeah. You know, but so there's too much too much at risk. There is way too much you at know, risk. I mean, the challenge is that you, you, the administrators have a lot on their plate. Um, you know, you don't want to step on somebody's toes, especially when they're, you know, evaluating you later and stuff like that. Right. But then the challenge is, you know, 
perhaps the, the, the best course of action is you reach out to the district level and say, okay, you know, who's in charge of these services? Right. You know, when, when we set this up, um, you know, I called the, dis- the the school districts and I called, you know, the sheriff's office and, and I'm sure on a, I'm on a couple lists because I called the sheriff's office and I said, I'm looking at whoever comes and does the trainings for active school shooters, you know, and it was like, what? It was like, let me explain, let me explain. But, you know, maybe there's a need to call the district level or, or call the, the local, sure. you know, the city hall and say, who deals with this? Who do I talk to above that would deal in this area. Yeah, no, I, I would think here in this county in particular that, you know, we're fortunate because we do have dedicated individuals who do these things on a day-to-day basis. Mm-hmm. So the folks that I work with in my office, you know, I mean, that's what we do. Yeah. We follow up on issues that haven't been dealt with. Um, we find things on our own, but we also follow through once we're notified. You know, we, we contact law enforcement. Yeah. We work with law enforcement on a day-to-day basis. So, you know, we, we have the ability here to do that. And some school districts may not have that. Yeah. They, might, they may not even have an individual that's designated as their security professional for that facility. You know, I mean, maybe it's a lead teacher who kind of, by the way, will you just kind of think of some yeah. ways to make this place safer? and Administrator. Right. So, so the, the takeaway is it, what, what eats me up all the time is I'll drop my son off at his elementary school, you know, I'm there five minutes ahead of time, the door's locked, and then once the bell goes off, the door's open. And it's pretty much open access for 10, 15 minutes while people are coming and going. And there's officers out front directing traffic, but then up, you know, 100 feet, 200 feet, when we get close to the front of the building, it's just open access in and out. Right. And then after that first bell goes off, the doors are locked. But I've been in schools where you know, first thing in the morning, they would basically, you know, usher all the kids through and then the late kids would go through the metal detectors and stuff like that. Right. So as a parent, I'm walking up saying, okay, I know it's ease of use to get in and out. Right. And I don't have to stop, but this is a safety hazard. So it's really, I mean, is it incumbent on me to stop off one day at the the principal's office and say, why do you do it this way? Or why do we have two officers out front? We could have one, just having one officer stand here in the front you know, would make a big difference. Right. I think that, you know, I mean, if school staff members see that there's a a hole in their security plan, then they should bring that up, you know, I mean, as well as parents. I mean, we do get phone calls all the time from parents who say, hey, listen, I was at this school and this is what I saw going on. I don't agree with it. And they may may offer some solutions, Mm -hmm. Um, you know, some of those solutions we may be able to enact. Some of them may be good. Some of them we may not be able to enact. Yeah. Um, but schools should have plans to deal with those things, and they should have an open mind. Mm-hmm. I mean, if they're employees, we, we listen to our employees. You know, um, after the tragedy in Parkland happened, you know, that's one of the things that we, we did. We, we want to know. So tell us what we can do better. Mm-hmm. You know, if you see a hole in our plan, tell us what we can do better. That way we can consider those options, figure out how we can implement them, and keep everyone in the end hopefully safer than they were before. Yeah. But certainly, uh, you know, teachers... Other district employees and parents, everyone has the ability to reach out to the administration and let them know what they're seeing on their campus. So see something, say something, but also feel free to evaluate. And, and students say, do, though. Students yeah. can do that as well. And they should. And we do get students that do that. Mm-hmm. Had, uh, matter of fact, I got an email today where a student had crafted some type of door locking device that's bolted into the, the a wall on the inside of the room and then it just hooks around the door handle. You know, unfortunately, we, we can't use those. Yeah. The state fire marshal's office prohibits us from, from using any mechanical mechanisms outside of the normal locking mm-hmm. mechanisms that are established to lock the doors, you know, but I'm, but it's forward thinking and I appreciate yeah. the fact that, that the student would bring that forward and, and, you know, try to think of ways to stay safe. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, once again, uh, we're talking about being vigilant. Uh, anything that we left off? Um, so, you know, I know we, we talked a lot, I don't know how we're doing on time, but I just kind of had a couple things that, um, might be, might be somewhat interesting. Um, and that, so the, one of the questions here is how to recognize what's wrong or right. Uh-huh. Yeah. You know, I mean, how, how do you do that? And, and I think I'm, I hit on this before, before we went on camera, is that sometimes training can help. Mm-hmm. You know, scenarios in, in, the, in the emergency responder world, most of the training at, at one point turns into just scenarios. Um, so schools could, could draft a scenario and then run their teachers through it and then afterward, debrief with them and say, hey, listen, tell me what you saw. You know, and in that scenario, they could have things in there, you know, maybe a gun laying on a table over here or a jewel laying over here or a knife underneath on the seat or underneath the desk. And just ask them, hey, what, what did you see? 
and then go back and critique them and, and tr try to help them build in the sense of looking around instead of just looking at something. You know, seeing what's there, what the environment's like, you know. I mean, they can do it with all sorts of ways. You can get really creative when it comes to scenarios. But doing a debrief afterward can be extremely helpful. Mm -hmm. And I think, for me, you know, I happen to be the, the whole kinesthetic learning kind of thing. I, yeah. I, I got to see, hear, yeah. do. Yeah. And then I got it, you know. So for me, those things work for me. Yeah. And especially when you go back and you walk me through the scenario again and you show me that this guy over here had a weapon tuck, tucked in his pants. And if I just looked... I would have observed the weapon in the guy's pants. I didn't that, see it. That wakes yeah. me up. You yeah, know, that wakes me up. So those that's just one way of doing that, you know. And I know teachers when they get off they want to go home. Yeah. I, when I get off I want to go home. Yeah, exactly. You know. We all want to go home. That's right. that's the trick. Anything else? Uh, let's see here. Um, what do you do? I think we hit on that. What do you do when you recognize that something's not wrong mm -hmm. or right or you feel like you're not being heard? I think we talked about that. Um, one of the other things too um, is that you know, knowing the signs of what there, there are certain Things, certain physical behaviors that human beings will perform when they're when they're not in their right mind. Okay. Um, and I'm I'm not saying somebody's mentally ill. I'm just talking about an individual who is about to do something that's wrong. Mm -hmm. You know, whether it be a fight's about to break out between kids. So um, you know, there is additional training that they could get on that. I'm sure um, that you could get. But just a couple of things that I just wrote down right away from my background is, you know, I mean, obviously somebody standing there talking to you and, and they start shouting at you and yelling at you. Yeah. That's a, you know, that'd be a sign that something's not right. Um, individuals who are just staring, that thousand yard stare. Teachers probably get that all the time. I yeah. would imagine in classrooms from students. Who but are also mad. looking away. I had a friend uh, we talked about before that was, you know, in the military. Um, and his dad was a prison guard. And the sure. first time I met sure. him, I didn't look at him in the eyes. And then right after that, he's like, I don't like that guy. And I had to go back and like build his trust and stuff like that. But because he said, you know, you know, in, in jail, you don't, you know, the, the guys that really are the troublesome ones are the ones that won't look you straight in the eye when they're talking to you. And I was like, all right, mental note. I didn't even think about that. But he learned that through training. Yeah. He learned that through experience and through training in, inside whatever facility he was in. Mm -hmm. Um, a couple other things too is some you know a lot of a lot of times in my experience when somebody was going to run from me or flee or attack me they would make a weird noise so it'd be <laughs> some strange noise like mm, you know just weird stuff yeah. people just do weird stuff or um, you know they take up a fighting stance I mean that's pretty pretty yeah. straightforward um, other individuals I, I actually had this happen to me uh, a guy began to urinate himself right there standing in front of yeah. me and had I not known. To look for these things as a potential, you know, pre what we call pre attack cue, I would have just thought the guy was crazy. Well, he yeah. might, you know, he might not have been there anyway, but. Before he was going to attack you? Yes. He just started urinating? Yeah. Yeah. That was interesting. Yeah. Uh, so and then wonderful. you have individuals whose, whose bodies will just begin to twitch uncontrollably. Okay. Because of the whole nervousness and they're, you know, they're going into the fight or flight yeah. response mode, um, you know, that sort of thing. Or the individuals who just kind of pace back and forth, you know. They're talking to you, but they're pacing back and forth, pacing back and forth. Yeah. So they're ramping up internally for what they're about to do. They're convincing themselves, all right, all right, all right, I'm about to do this. So um, those are just some of the things, you know, physically that you might see with yeah. a human. You know, or they make eye contact with you and a real quick look away, which is yeah. what you were talking about. Yeah. You know, you make eye contact with them and they're standing out there in your parking lot looking into a car and you go, hey. And they look at you and all of a sudden they turn and walk they away. They take off, yeah. So what do you do with that, mm -hmm. you know? You 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 you, you be observant. You be vigilant. You see something. You say something. You notify right. others. You know, and if, if you're the the person that can handle it, you you handle it. You know, if you're an officer, you go handle it. If not, you know, I I, I spoke uh, after our last talk with a friend of mine that's a, a school resource resource officer and an assistant principal up north, and he said, look, we got guys that know how to deal with this stuff. You know, teachers don't. Get out, you know. We got people that know how to handle it. They can deal with it. They're trained. They've got all the the equipment. They'll deal with it. Get out of the way. Right. You know. Um, one other thing that I think would be important too is that if, if teachers know their campus security features, mm -hmm. in other words, they know the cameras, they know the lighting, they know where these objects are at, they know where the fencing is at, they know that that gate should be locked from this time until this time. Yeah. You know, knowing those features can also help them be more aware of things that are wrong or out of place on their campus. Yeah. So gates are locked, fences are up, yeah. and they see a kid jump the fence or they see an adult jump the fence. 
you know, I mean, to them, that's if they know that those are there and that people aren't supposed to do those things, then that can also help them out. What's the plan? What's the process? These right. doors are always locked. This right. light's always on. This light's out now. You know, this door, the lock's broken. You know, right. know what's supposed to happen. And if you if you see things and, you know, there might not be a plan. There might be a building that doesn't really have a plan. Well, there should you know? be. All of our schools. Your schools, All yes. of our schools you know? are required to have a facility yeah. security plan. They have to submit it to our office. Mm-hmm. And it talks about who does what on that campus. Yeah. What the procedures are for gates that are normally like you talked about yeah. when students arrive. What's the procedure? Who is where in that building when yeah. all of these kids are dumping into the building? You know, it is a vulnerable time. Yeah. So where are the teachers supposed to be stationed at inside that building? Yeah. At what point does this individual lock that door? Mm-hmm. You know, how, how does all yeah. that shake out? So knowing your security uh, plan and knowing your security features on your campus, yeah. I think is a huge one. One of the strong points and the weak yes. points of that, of that campus. Anything else? Uh, I, th- I think that's probably good. I think we've done, that's good. I think we've done pretty good here. Um, and the goal here is to talk about vigilance and talk about what it means and what it looks like. Um, obviously, your perspectives on vigilance are much more honed and refined than mine. Um, you know, but it's something that through experience and through training and, you know, and, and forethought, we can build up. Um, but it's important to remain vigilant. It's important to see something and say something. It's important to uh, pay attention and notice and report out. Um, any other closing thoughts? No, um, you know, I just, I know that in the scope of a day, there's just so many things happening. You know, I, I know you come home from work and you're just wiped out and you just want to get out of there. But, you know, when you see these things occur on your campus, some of the best tips that we get are coming from teachers who saw something and they notified us. Some of the, some of the worst tips that we get are the ones that they waited till the next day at noon to notify us something that they saw the previous day at two o'clock, mm-hmm. you know, or and then, then by that time, it's it may be too late. You know, the crime may now have been committed. Yep. The theft may have been perpetuated. It's all done. Yeah. So waiting and hesitating to make that notification. I'll tell you, in the law enforcement world, you may get an officer that shows up and it's got 10 reports deep. And they've got to write every one of those reports at the end of shift. But in the end, if you don't tell them, they can't help you. So you have to let them know so that that's not the, whether or not they have to write a report is not your problem. <laughs> Your job is to let them know so that they can do their part. And so hesitating to notify somebody is a big, big deal. Lots of burglaries I worked in the days leading up to the burglary, there was a suspicious car parked out front. Mm -hmm. Car parked out front, car parked out front. And when I came up to the car, it rolled off. Would you call law enforcement? No, I never did. Well, you might have prevented that burglary from occurring had you shared that information prior to the actual Mm -hmm. event. So... Absolutely. Do something about what you're seeing, you know. Be vigilant, and and we'll close by saying something we said earlier. We all want to go home. That's correct. We all want to go home. So thanks for watching. Thanks again for uh, spending time with us and letting me pester you uh, to get this info out there. It's all good. I think it's very, very important that we think about this and we have this... These, these hard discussions and talk about things that we don't really want to or we normally don't talk about. Um, but I think we live in a place where we live in a world where there is some culture of fear um, and through our dialogue and, and teaching ourselves and learning, um, you know, we can figure out how do we best deal in that culture of fear. Sure. Um, so thanks once again. Thank you.